Welcome to the SEI Podcast Series, a production of the Carnegie Mellon University Software Engineering Institute. The SEI is a federally funded research and development center sponsored by the U.S. Department of Defense. A transcript of today's podcast is posted on the SEI website at sei.cmu.edu slash podcasts. Hi, my name is Suzanne Miller. I'm a principal researcher in the SEI Software Solutions Division. Today, I'm joining you in the middle of an ice storm in Pennsylvania, in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and we've had some power fluctuations, so I apologize if that affects how this uh, video looks today. But even so, um, my colleague and friend, Dr. Carol Woody, is joining me today, who is also a principal researcher. She's over in the SEI CERT division, and her work has focused on government agencies, higher education, medical organizations, a, a wide variety of uh, situations. And she's been a frequent guest on our show to talk about her research in the field of cybersecurity engineering and government agencies. Today, we're going to be talking about supply chain issues and the planning that needs to take place to integrate software from the supply chain into our operational environments. And there's a lot of different operational environments that, that we are uh, going to be talking about. We also are going to talk about building a cybersecurity engineering strategy for DevSecOps that addresses those supply chain challenges. Welcome, Carol. It's always good to talk with you. Thank you. Good to be here. Excellent. All right, so I want to start off by having you tell us a little bit about yourself, what brought you to the SEI, and the work that you do here on a day-to-day -day basis for our viewers who may not know you as well as I do. Appreciate that. I uh, am focused on researching how to mine what we know in the operational environment from cybersecurity and figure out how we better engineer and structure our systems so that it can more they can more effectively join this uh, very challenging environment. Um, too frequently we're finding that uh, the knowledge we expect our systems and software engineers to have uh, is not there. So we've been focused on educating them extensively in terms of what's happening in the operational environment. Uh, and tied with that, what we were, ta we're talking about today is that really they're not planning for the real context that they're having to address. So we've got to make that integration much smoother. And as we move into the DevSecOps environment, that integration is going to pick up speed. Uh, we have to be better prepared for how we're going to be fielding incrementally built systems in a way that we can keep them secure sufficiently as we increase their capability and, uh, uh, and functionality. So it's very much of a balancing act, but it's one that's going to require a lot of expertise. Uh, and uh, we've got to make sure we have the right eyes on the problem at the right time. Tied with that, uh, well, one other area. Uh, tied with that, more and more of our software is coming from third parties. Uh, so we know less and less about the details of it, and the people that are building it are much more integrators as opposed to writers of software. So, so we that's have to look lot. through that, yes. Um, and so we're going to unpack that sort of one step at a time. And uh, But before we do that, um, just tell people a little bit about how you ended up at the SEI, because I, I think everybody always likes to know, how did Carol get here? How did Susie get here? Um, so just give us a little bit of that background. Well, I started in software in college, um, learning how to, uh, to program and eventually moved out into the software development and worked my way up career rise into uh, uh, systems design and then strategic planning. Mm -hmm. uh, I was in consulting in New York City for uh, uh, many years and uh, at that point decided that I really wanted to finish my PhD and uh, move into research. Uh, and at that point, the Software Engineering Institute was hiring, but they wanted to hire me on the cybersecurity side. And it was very perplexing. It didn't really fit what I had 
known, um, but we talked a good bit and eventually they convinced me that I needed to learn cybersecurity and really focus on that. Uh, so it's been an exciting ride ever since. Major learning curve uh, initially and then beyond that, trying to figure out how we converge the languages mm -hmm. of the operational security side into the uh, languages and approaches that have been structured around acquisition and development. Uh, it's truly two separate stovepipes that really don't uh, converge very well. Um, so we're continuing that uh, effort and also trying to uh, build educational material that we can drive out into the academic environment because they don't really teach cybersecurity in the schools. So if you're hiring your engineer, you can't even assume that they've heard the word security, much less know how to do it. Um, so it's a, a, a fascinating and a major area to, to be working in. And, and I just, the reason I like you to tell your story is that switch in career. You know, mm -hmm. you're, you're the example for me of I'm not stuck anywhere. You know, if I want to no. learn something new, it doesn't matter if I'm 20 or I'm 40, I can learn something new and become an expert in a new field. And you've done that so beautifully. So thank you for okay. sharing that with us. All right. I always love a challenge. So in a previous podcast with us, you talked about how to build a cybersecurity strategy. And I would reference people to that. We'll put it in the transcript. But today we want to talk, take a deeper dive and examine how to build a cybersecurity strategy for DevSecOps that integrates with the supply chain, taking those two things and putting them together. So let's start with the challenges that organizations face, and you introduced some of them already, when you're integrating software from the supply chain. We've got, I don't know what's in it. We've got, I don't know where it comes from. What are some of the other challenges that our, our, uh, that our organizations are facing? One of the key areas that we see is that organizations really don't figure out what is at risk. So they're making many of their risk decisions around cost and schedule and thinking about only the components relative to um, cybersecurity. They're looking at how do I worry about cybersecurity of the code? How do I worry about the cybersecurity in my uh, design model? And not really looking at when you're fielding a system, what you're actually doing is connecting up suppliers and supplier software through the design that you've put together into an operational environment. And none of this is static. All of it has to be continually updated and refreshed because we have a very complex operational attack environment that has to be factored in. Um, the systems that we field need to be built to recognize problems, resist them, and then recover from them quickly. All of that has to be part of the way we build systems. Uh, one of the examples that we studied um, in starting this project was a major four-part system, and each one of the parts had to be started up separately uh, and then integrated, and it took four hours to restart the system and operations would make choices of not bringing up some of the pieces if they happen to have a problem uh, because it took everybody down for four hours. Um, that's not an acceptable process. If you have a, uh, an attack on one of those four components that you need to resurrect from quickly. And, and one of the things that we've talked about before is that when we say supply chain, we're really talking about multiple layers. And I may know exactly. a lot about my immediate supplier, but what about their suppliers? And what about their suppliers that are using open source code, even though my supplier, I don't allow to use open source code. Um, you know, how are, how are we dealing with, how does cybersecurity strategy address that sort of layered view of the supply chain? Well, we have to recognize it as a reality, and we're not going to be able to fix everything all at once. It's a journey, uh, and we've got to continually be thinking about what risks do we care about the most immediately. Um, 
we're we're basically building maturity at the same time as we're trying to deal with um, fielding. Uh, and this is one of the challenges with uh, as we migrate into a DevSecOps environment. We're fielding more quickly, but we're building maturity into the tools, how, what we know about how to build our systems, how our suppliers are feeding us it information and uh, code that we can integrate. But then we're also learning from the operational environment and have to factor that back into how we're functioning and building systems and respond more quickly. Um, it's a culture shift as well as just the mechanics of what we're doing and how we're dealing with this. Every one of these pieces represents some level of risk we cannot be totally risk averse. We have to recognize that there will be risks that we have to accept. Which ones of them are acceptable? Well, that depends on what your system's doing. That depends on the context in which it's functioning, the mission in which it's uh, supporting, and uh, how robust your recovery mechanisms are. Uh, if you can recover in two seconds, maybe you care a lot less about how robust it is, if you can immediately bring it back, uh, than if it takes you four hours. Um, and if you're dealing with uh, data that... Um, is you know highly uh, sensitive and you're dealing with processes that are highly critical to uh, uh, like healthcare and uh, banking and these areas that people care a lot about, then you're much more risk averse than you would be if you're running a Zoom session like we're on. Um, you want a certain amount of protection, but maybe not to the, uh, to the same level. So all of these have to be planned for. And that's really what your cybersecurity strategy is. It's got to include all of the elements you're dealing with uh, and recognize that these are parts of the anatomy of the product that you're building. Uh, you can't just focus on the code or just focus on the design, which is too frequently what we're seeing. So it, you've given a beautiful description of a lot of the whys that we need to do this, and especially with DevSecOps and the speed that DevSecOps gives us for uh, being able to deploy, deploy uh, updated software more frequently. What You've given us a couple of the elements of a cybersecurity engineering strategy. What are the pieces of it that are specific to the supply chain aspect that people, if they've built a cybersecurity strategy before, but have only really dealt with it you know, within their own code, what's different about addressing a cybersecurity strategy for an, for an integrated supply chain? What's different is that you need to factor in the time delays that um, who controls which parts have to be addressed. Uh, for example, the most latest, uh, the, the latest supply chain risk we're dealing with, with uh, Log4j, the suppliers can't fix their code overnight, but you have an immediate risk that you have to deal with. And so you're going to have to temporarily um, mitigate those risks in some way until you can get the information from the supplier and apply the patch or the fix or whatever needs to be done uh, for a more permanent solution. So you're always in a situation of waiting for the uh, entity that owns the code to make the fix. Now, if you look at a supply chain that goes four or five layers down, if the problem is way down in those layers, that's a lot of waiting you may have to do. Uh, and also you run the risk of the suppliers that are underneath not recognizing that they have a problem. Uh, and so you may be at risk for longer than you expect, um, which really puts looking at and understanding your operational environment to be very critical uh, and knowing when the system is functioning properly and how it behaves if it has a problem. Too frequently right now, we don't know what our operational environment really looks like. I mean, think of all the changes we've dealt with in the last three years. What What is normal? 
Uh, I don't think we know right now. And uh, so detecting something that's out of normal, that would be behavior that wouldn't be not quite what we expect is becoming harder. Uh, and in these instances, we're learning a lot of it by accident and then trying to scramble and figure out how to respond. So part of what we have to recognize in planning is that these things are going to happen. They're, they're not once and done. This is a new pattern that we have to factor into how we think about and build systems. Uh, and it's that thinking that needs to be on, on the plate when you're building your cybersecurity strategy. So I, I'm a software manager and you've scared me to death. Uh, well Sorry. done. Well done. Um, <laughs> Sorry. And if I'm trying to address this in my organization, what are some of the first steps that I need to take? I've already heard I need to understand my operational environment much better than I probably do. I've heard that I need to know, uh, you know who my suppliers are and to the extent possible, understand who their suppliers are. What are some of the other things that are steps that I need to go through to address this, especially if I'm trying to integrate my, my brand new DevSecOps pipeline that's just chugging away beautifully? Um, how, do I, how do I go about doing this? Well, software people need to be working closely with the systems engineers as a start, because what you really need is a very good picture of the system. And the reason you need that is that you need to understand the attack surface that you're dealing with. What kind of risk are the ways that you're operating and executing uh, forcing you to have to, to deal with? Uh, and the attack surface is much more now than, than just what inputs come into my system and how does my code operate and what outputs am I producing? Because you're dealing with a development environment that's tightly coupled now with your operational environment, your development environment now becomes part of your attack surface. So you need to look at the robustness of the development environment, the tools that you're using, how they're integrated, how they're managed and monitored, and the potential, potential impact that could have on the code you're actually fielding. Also, from a software perspective, you need to make sure that as you're building the system incrementally, that you're creating the right level of robustness, reliability with each increment that gets fielded to meet the risk environment that is being fielded in so that you can continue to support the mission. You can't just say, oh, I need all these lovely features and throw the features out first and we'll get to security later. Uh, that's been too much of a traditional approach in terms of how systems have been built. It's got to be thought about, designed, and tied together right from the beginning. And you have to link in and design for how you're going to recognize, resist, and recover from these things. What is What monitoring is built in the system so that when uh, operations is looking at things, what can they see? What can they identify and discover? Or are you just not tracking the things that they might need? All of those are part of the planning and design that need to be considered. And a reality is that insider threat is what we need to be worried about as well. So in some cases, your organizational structure that's around how you're building and fielding the system becomes part of your attack surface. Uh, that is maybe beyond what software itself would consider, but it does become an entry point that then fielding the software needs to be able to look at and say, someone that is has access to these capabilities probably should not also have access to these other capabilities. Uh, and that might be part of how you think about the design as well as how you think about setting up your uh, authentication and authorization. Where do you need to have your risks mitigated and how important are they? Um, those are all very tough decisions and too frequently we've got them being made either just in the supply chain so that your suppliers are making decisions for you that then feed into your system that you're not aware of, which what you had mentioned earlier, open source is being involved. Um, 
we're looking at trying to institute things like software bill of materials to make those more visible so that you can decide, do I want to accept this or is the risk too great and I don't happen to want that component in my system? Right now, we're not prepared to make those decisions, but we've got to think about them and how we want to deal with them. So it's a journey. Uh, we want to uh, improve how we're doing things. We know we've got a baseline with gaps. What are those gaps and how risky are those gaps? We may need some mitigations temporarily in place until our tools and our capabilities and methods are in better shape to handle these risks. So one of the things that I can imply from what you said is that a cybersecurity engineering strategy isn't just a software strategy, that, that it really is a system and, and an organizational level strategy. Did right. I get that correct? Yes. It's got to be thought about as a key component there, yeah. tying those pieces together. And it's got to tie with your acquisition uh, efforts because really you're dealing with your suppliers through contracts. You're setting up relationships with them. Uh, it's not like you take their product and you never see them again. In this situation, you need them to be maintaining what they are delivering for the long haul because you're depending on it. Right. Uh, and how important that dependency is has to be factored into your risk management. So if I'm trying to if I'm trying to build a strategy like this, what are some of the challenges, red flags that that I should be looking for within the organization that would help me to know that one we're not ready for this or although you have to be ready for this or you know you what, have are, to what start are some of the dealing things, with this. Yeah, I got to start somewhere. But what are some of the, the challenges that you know of that people run into when they try and, and do this? Too frequently, we're seeing all of these different components being handled in stovepipes. We have one group that's building a DevSecOps pipeline in isolation. Um, requirements are being thrown over the wall at, from systems uh, and even software engineering and fed into the pipeline with no real linkage to what does that mean to the product and the cybersecurity. So you need all of those eyes working together. Uh, and most organizations don't have the organizational structure in place to support those communications. Uh, they don't have visibility. In some cases, the systems engineers don't even know who the software engineers are. Uh, things are separated, and they definitely don't know who is handling the operations and the IT side. Um, we have data that we're building data rich environments, but what we're not building are information rich environments. So we've got to be looking at the data analytics and how it can make what we're uh, producing and all the tools we're using and the pieces that we're operating useful to us in the long run to improve. So everything has to be organized around how do we improve, not just the processes and the mechanics for faster delivery, but also the integration and the information sharing and the analytics so that we can do a better job of recognize, resist, and recover. Excellent. This is a lot. This is probably one of the richest podcasts in terms of information that, that, that we've done in a while. Um, and so... This says to me that there's a big transition challenge um, in getting yes. what you're talking about out into the, the hands of the people that are, um, are trying to get to it. What are some of the resources that we have available to people that are trying to adopt this to help them kind of work their way through all the things we've talked about to get to uh, an improved posture in terms of their cybersecurity strategy? And, and I'll preview that by saying I know you happen to have published a blog post and a webcast on this. So um, those are certainly uh, things yes. I know that people would, would want to look at. Uh, there, uh, we co-authored a book that goes into the basics of what needs to be done. There is a, a cybersecurity uh, certification 
for software assurance as well that covers a lot of the background and some of the methods in this area is touching on uh, what you need to do for requirements, what you need to think about for the supply chain. It's, it's not a how-to, it's more of an understanding because the real challenge we have is that each system that you're creating and each operational environment you're targeting as well as the way you're building it is unique. Mm -hmm. So it, there are a lot of similarities that can be shared, but what we're also looking at is how can we provide uh, basic um, levels of understanding that can be taken in, templates that can be used. Um, we have uh, a lot of uh, information about threat modeling that we're looking at, uh, which would say, how do you look at this attack surface that you're building to begin to figure out which threats are important to you, and then factor that into um, the way you're thinking about the system and what you need to do. Uh, we've also been working on a an independent uh, model that will um, assemble the issues in DevSecOps that need to be considered relevant to uh, software assurance and cybersecurity. Um, things like what requirements are critical, um, what processes and practices need to be in place um, so that you can begin to compare yourself to the model to say, where are we, where are the gaps, where are the areas that we need to improve. Uh, you're probably not in a situation where things are immediately going to go up in flames in any one moment, uh, unless you happen to be have the joy of being one of the victims for the latest attack. Um, but you you want to create an environment that's as resilient as the product that you're trying to push out, uh, and as we more tightly couple all of those pieces, we've got to have them working together more tightly. The communication and the integration among those has to be reflected in how we talk about problems, who we talk to, um, who we share information with. All of that coupling is becoming more and more critical. And your suppliers now are becoming part of that integration need. Uh, they need to understand what your issues are, and they need to be lined up to support you. Um, so all of these relationships have to be initially established and then nurtured over time. Uh, and we are currently not organized for that. Everybody is really structured in very highly specialized stovepipes. In many cases, we all use different terminologies for the same thing. So we talk past each other a lot. Uh, and, and that's created some amazing dialogues that <laughs> I, I, I can't even begin to describe. So I actually really resonated with your statement that said we need to create environments that are as resilient as the products that we're pushing out. I think that's kind of a, a summary in many ways of what we're trying mm -hmm. to achieve. The cybersecurity engineering strategy is one of the ways that we're trying to achieve that. Right. But as a, as a big goal. I really like that as a, as a, as a big goal for that. Um, so you've done many things related and you talked about some of them in terms of uh, transition mechanisms. What are you looking at doing next in this area of work? What is the, what are your research interests in, in moving this forward? Well, we're in the process of assembling the practices that are really critical to uh, integrating program management, engineering, and the supply chain, uh, and articulating those in a way that we can begin to move ahead and determine, do we have the right things in place? Mm -hmm. uh, because we're seeing those relationships uh, as being really critical. Um, uh, one of the participates, one of the participants in that research with me uh, has been working with uh, uh, this effort under DHS, and they have been using supplier risk management uh, assessments through the critical infrastructure uh, mm -hmm. for a good number of years now. So we're looking at leveraging that and augmenting it with the engineering aspects to define what it is uh, that needs to be in place. And so organizations can begin to look at themselves more critically and say, what are we missing? Uh, 
Mm -hmm. Uh, And if that's a risk, then we've got to begin to figure out how to address it. I want to thank you for this conversation. I think there's a lot of people that, that, that hear the words, but don't really get the message that this supply chain stuff really does have an impact on many, many aspects of our operating environments, the products that rely on Mm -hmm. the uh, electricity infrastructure and all the things that go along with that. Um, So thank you very much. Um, And for our listeners and viewers, uh, thank you for joining us today on this uh, ice storm day in Pennsylvania. We managed to get through uh, the podcast without any further power fluctuations. So we've got we've, somebody's got the recover piece going, even if, they, if even if we don't have resist all the way in place. Um, so we will include links in our transcript to all the resources that Carol has mentioned, including the blog and the webcast and some of the other things that she talked about. Um, For those of you that aren't familiar with where to find us, this podcast is available on the SEI website at sei.cmu.edu slash podcast and anywhere else you get your podcast, iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Spotify, and even YouTube because we're a video too. And if you find us on YouTube, please feel free to give us a thumbs up. We love thumbs up. Um, As always, if you have any follow-up questions about this discussion or Carol's work, please don't hesitate to email us at info at sei.cmu.edu. Thank you very much. Thanks for joining us. This episode is available where you download podcasts, including SoundCloud, Stitcher, TuneIn Radio, Google Podcasts, and Apple Podcasts. It is also available on the SEI website at sei.cmu.edu slash podcasts and the SEI's YouTube channel. This copyrighted work is made available through the Software Engineering Institute, a federally funded research and development center sponsored by the U.S. Department of Defense. For more information about the SEI and this work, please visit www.sei.cmu.edu. As always, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to email us at info at sei.cmu.edu. Thank you.